our first double coverage show, Jackie Franchuli, Cassidy Hill. Um, this is this is the one with the pilot episode, Cassidy. So to an homage to all Friends fans everywhere. Um, I thought about coming in in a wedding dress just to, <laughs> to really bring it all together. But I do have my coffee. So it, it's, it, this is my Friends homage right now, and including to, for the one for our first episode. There we go. Yeah. We're, we're in our mini central I don't part. Know where to put this. I only have exactly. water. I feel like I'm, I'm shaming us by only having water. You know what? I even have a light up Central Perk like hanging thing that I might have up here next week. I don't know why I didn't think about that for this week until just now, this moment. <laughs> next, well, we have, next week, next come back to that. Are you teasing to next week's show? We'll have a Central Yes, Park. exactly. Already preparing. <laughs> so uh, before we kind of dive into some of the topics we're going to be talking about today, uh, you know, just an overview of, you know, who I am and who Cassidy is, um, you know, if you're familiar with the Florida beat, both Cassie and I have been on the beat of quite a few years. I came from covering the ACC and Virginia basketball and football for a few years. I've covered high school recruiting, um, both in the ACC and the SEC uh, since about 2013. Um, so, and now I'm back in Gainesville. I'm working for TV 20, but I also cover the Florida Gators for a couple of different outlets. Um, I do a lot of stuff for video. If you've been following of this YouTube channel that has changed its name to now double coverage of Jackie and Cassidy, then you've known that I do a couple of video stories of behind the scenes things. And that's sort of thing that we want to show you more behind the scenes, getting to know these players and former Gators and coaches. And that's what we want. We want you to show who these people are. They're not just people who are scoring touchdowns, scoring points, uh, whatever sport you're into. That's not what our aim here is to have interviews so that you understand who these people really are. Um, and instead of just showing you stats, hopefully breaking down the game as well and X's and O's and kind of getting a more in-depth kind of look at these games, but also fun topics, right, Cassidy? Uh, we will break down, you know, The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. And, uh, Which is a sport in and of itself nowadays. Hey, I have brackets every year, you know. Exactly. So I never win. I never, never win. Well, you but know, they're they, fun. They, don't, they don't follow the script, Cassidy. They don't follow. Right. They always pick the villain at one point. I started, I went, I was winning for a while. And then my friends realized it's just because I was reading Reality Steve before I made my bracket. <laughs> and uh, so I got kicked out of those fantasy leagues. Whatever. I'm not bitter. But... <laughs> Cassidy, we're going to have a talk when we have our own brackets that you're not allowed to read reality, Steve. That's the number one rule. But uh, introduce, a little, bit. <laughs> introduce yeah. a little bit about you, Cassidy. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, so I have been in Gainesville since 2012. I am a University of Alabama graduate. Don't hold that against me. Um, grew up an Auburn fan, then graduated from Alabama. I'm a disappointment to my entire family, especially my <laughs> grandma. But uh, came to Gainesville in 2012 just because this is where I wanted to be. This is the school I always wanted to cover. This is the team I always wanted to cover. If for no other reason than it just looked fun. And um, loved my time at Alabama. I got to cover one of the national championships. I don't even remember which one now. And, um, and it was a lot of fun. But, but Florida was just so much fun. And after coming from such a serious program, I was like, that's where I want to be. I want to be down in Florida and I want to be down in Gainesville. Uh, so showed up in 2012. My very first game was the Florida versus South Carolina game, which had college game day there. And then the uh, Gators were number three in the country and went to the Sugar Bowl. I can still vivid. I can sometimes when the thunder shakes the house, I'm reminded of the hit that John Bostic put <laughs> in that game on uh, who was, was that? Teddy Bridgewater. Yeah, it was before that he put on Teddy Bridgewater. Uh, and then they got blown out of that game. And then the next year they had a four win season, topped off with the Georgia Southern loss. That was a special moment for everyone involved. Um, but I've been here ever since and, and just love covering this program, you know, try to be as unbiased as possible as a journalist. But I, I just, I love being here. I love being around the Gator program. I also get to cover the Jaguars now for Sports Illustrated, which has been a lot of fun, just kind of dipping my toe into the NFL. And I think I have worked for just about every outlet covering the Gators over the past eight you years. Both, I don't know, Cassidy. You I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> it's like, oh, well, you know, worked for everybody, but that means it's only for a couple of years. Anyways, point is, um, 
I've had a lot of fun and that means I've gotten to know a lot of the people that cover this beat as well. And, uh, you know, like Jackie says, she's been here for the past few years as well. And what we have both always loved and appreciated and what I've always maintained about the Florida beat is that every reporter on the beat brings a little something different to the table. And we all look at it from a different perspective and we have a sort of a different viewpoint on it and a different way to approach it and a different way to approach the story and our job. And I think that's what makes it special because it gives fans such a wide variety of things to choose from. It's not just the same thing over and over. So that's why when Jackie and I said, hey, let's add another Gator podcast to a saturated market, uh, we knew we could offer something a little different. And it, a lot of it's just because of you, the fans, you know, but we're, we'll cover a lot of Gators. We'll also do some Jaguars. Jackie's a big Premier League fan. And I and have some we'll questions some... to Dan Mullen about his choice of EPL team. Liverpool, yeah. not who I would have chosen, obviously, but yeah. yeah. My knowledge of the Premier League goes as far as Ted Lasso. Um, but yeah, we kind of knew that we were, it, there were a lot of podcasts out there, but that this is also such a huge fan base. You know, Gator Nation is, is one of the biggest fan bases in the country, and uh, you guys eat this stuff up, and that's really kind of what made us feel comfortable enough to step out here and do this and to do it together. I think this is our first work venture together. Um, Jackie and I became close just on road trips a couple of years ago. We bonded. I can probably actually recall the exact moment I realized that Jackie and I were forever bonded, and it was the Baton Rouge trip, the LSU game, <laughs> Saturday morning. That was an 8 p.m. kick in Baton Rouge, and so we had some time, and so we woke up, we watched a little bit of college game day, and then we watched North and South, the old BBC, <laughs> the old BBC miniseries, and it was, and then we got ready, and then we went to Death Valley, and it was the perfect day, and I was like, okay, we can do this, we can, uh, we can rock and roll through all of these road trips together, and uh, that's kind of what we're just bringing here to this podcast is, uh, you know, you can get an inside look on what our conversations look like in those cars and those car rides, but also our conversations with former athletes, with parents, with, uh, you know, super fans, maybe even at times. Um, we'll talk a lot of X's and O's at times, but, but we also know you get that from other places too. And I think what has always sort of set Jackie and I apart on the beat is um, what we bring to the table as an interviewer. And, uh, you know, we're no Oprah, who reminded us all this week that she's the best interviewer of our time. Uh, we're no Oprah, but we are going to bring a little something different to the table. Um, speaking of Oprah, something happened this week, Jackie, this past week that uh, I think really reverberated across the country and uh, raised a lot of questions. It opened up a lot of hard conversations, and we just kind of want to address it before we go on any farther. Um, I am not talking about Prince Harry calling out his father on national television, but instead the WandaVision season finale. I know wow. you have a lot of thoughts. Have you, have you been able to get out of your own head? Have you stopped thinking about the ship of Theseus as you wash dishes yet? <laughs> uh, I, I've, I've stopped looking for Easter eggs, Cassidy. I have stopped watching YouTube videos showing me all the Easter eggs. Um, my husband and I have sat down and watched uh, like two hours worth of YouTube videos about everyone talking about all these Easter eggs because I want to know what's going to happen next. I was disappointed by the cameo. <laughs> I was like, oh, that was yeah. a big build up. Yes. And it was spoiler alert, if you, have, if you watch WandaVision, if you're Marvel nerds like Jackie and I are, and like we know a lot of you are because we see your tweets, um, spoiler alert, if you have not seen the WandaVision season finale yet, go get a cup of coffee while we talk about this. Okay. Now continue. I was thinking, is it going to be Magneto? Going to try to link in the X-Men and mutants in this? I was just, I was going to find the X-Men correctly and it'll ruin, you know. <laughs> the rogue character and have. Yeah, Gambit and Rogue in it. And all this thing and the fact that the true, like, the devil and Satan. Now. This to me was just a different way to give us Wanda's origin story. It was, you know, is, instead of a movie, it was a small series. Um, but all of that to say, I think that the series finale, season finale, the finale, kicked down the door and said, we are for sure going into the multiverse for yes. this next phase of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You know, we teased around with it in Infinity War and Endgame, but this now it is, it is going to be the driving force for the next four movies, at least in my yeah. opinion. We're going to actually talk some sports here yes. now, too. <laughs> um, Jackie, the Gators had a scrimmage on Saturday because mm -hmm. they were exactly halfway through spring practice. Since they started spring practice a little earlier, they go on February 20th, March 20th. Had scrimmage on Saturday. We both heard some stuff coming out of that scrimmage. 
I'll let you take it first, just on the notes that stood out to you from how that day went. Actually, it was Friday. I'm sorry. Because yeah, the storm so here in April, moved. Saturday, they moved it to Friday night. It moved to Friday, yeah. They had it Friday at the swamp. And, you know, the, one of the biggest things you could take away from the scrimmage is that the defense had a better day than the offense. You know, mm -hmm. it was something that multiple sources said, that the defense mm -hmm. won the day. Now, you can take that both ways. You can take it that the defense is just better, and they were a better cohesive unit, and they were, uh, you know, they just showed better on that day. Or you can take it as in the offense had a lot of struggles, <laughs> and they had a very bad day, and there's yeah. going to be a lot of problems. I think I go in the middle on this. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was a lot of good things that I've heard from the defense. I heard Derek Wingo had himself a day. Um, mm -hmm. It looked like, you know, obviously they can't contact the quarterback. Um, they can't actually sack him. But Derek Wingo would have gotten multiple sacks if he was allowed to tackle down the quarterback. <laughs> I, I think that is fantastic to hear because I was really mm -hmm. curious about him in particular. And the other guy that I was really curious about was Tyron Hopper. I've been on the Hopper fan club for a while now I wanted more reps for him last season every time he got in last year he did something good he did and I I was I I know there was you know from talking to people it was just hit, kind of adapting to the defense and learning the playbook obviously Grantham's defense is a little complicated so mm -hmm. he needed a little to extra time to get the playbook my but he is such a great player and has great instincts and he's such a physical guy and he had an interception um on Friday so I was really excited and happy to see that. And I, I know that when I say that I heard that the quarterbacks had five picks on that day, a lot of people are going to be like, oh, no, this is horrible. We, we had a Heisman contender at quarterback, and now we had five picks in the scrimmage. It was just a scrimmage, and it was the first one with a right. lot of new pieces on the offense. So we can breathe yeah. for just a second. Um, but yes, yeah, not the best day on the offense. And Dan Mullen in his press conference on Monday said they didn't really open the playbook as much and they kind of limited the quarterbacks. So take that as you will as well. Um, so, and, and I thought it was interesting that he said that. I think he, he knew mm -hmm. that as reports got out about the scrimmage that it was going to say that the quarterbacks didn't have a great day. And, and so I think that was his way of sort of um, getting in front of that and saying, you know, that we, we limited what they could do. We took away a lot of the game aspects and took away a lot of the playbook and limited what Emory, what Anthony, what uh, Del Rio, Wilson, what Kitna, what they could do. Um, because it, it wasn't a great day. You know, I think I've heard the same thing you did, five interceptions uh, spread out. You know, it was an equal opportunity interception day. I think they all threw one at some point. I mean, the, that's um, the defense were working hard, Cassidy. Exactly, yeah. I, it is, and, and I thought it was interesting that, that Dan said that about limiting the quarterbacks because typically scrimmages and spring practice, team drills, things like that, they're more conducive to the offense. So you hear, usually you hear better reports about the offense coming mm -hmm. out of these things. And um, so when, when that didn't happen, it was a little like, uh, like you said, it's just a scrimmage. Take a, take a lot of it with a grain of salt. But I did think it was interesting because that's just not typically a the type of notes you hear coming out of it and so then when when Mullen followed that up on Monday with that comment about limiting what the quarterbacks could do I saw that one as his way of getting out in front of the reports that he knew were going to be coming and two um just his explanation of of why they didn't have a great day and like you said a lot of new pieces in there and this is just a, a side note for maybe why the quarterbacks didn't have a great day or why there's going to be a little bit of a steeper learning curve with them is yes they've all been in this offense Emory Jones has been in this offense for three years Dan Mullen is very hands-on with the quarterbacks but they just lost Brian Johnson mm -hmm. and I, I know that Garrett McGee has was here last year that's his name right <laughs> Garrett, yes. yeah and I, I, I know he was here last year um but Brian Johnson had a very specific way he ran the quarterback unit during practice uh that he ran meetings things like that and that's not a knock on uh the new coach I just think it's going to take a while to get used to and um and and that might be a possible explanation for for why it's taking them a little bit longer to to catch up maybe why they had some trouble with different reads and things like that it's just you know they're, they're still finding their footing together um I did hear the running backs had a pretty decent day I think Lingard had a long touchdown uh to start the day that's going to be exciting um Demarcus Bowman 
didn't play in the scrimmage from he what didn't. I understand. No, he, he, and, he missed the practice before that as well from what I know. Right. Knew. Yeah. Yeah. He, it's not anything serious. It was just a precaution. Um, but yeah, good day for Lingard. Decent, pretty decent little day for Jacob Copeland. Caught a touchdown from Emory Jones. Um, and like you said, a really, really good day for the defense. Uh, heard good reports about Desmond Watson. You know, coaches want to get him slimmed down a little bit more. He's currently notoriously at like 432. He's a big man, he wanted, Cassidy. He's a big, he's a big old man. man. He, he casts the shadow as he walks across <laughs> the field. Um, but they want to get him down to around 380 by the season, which is, is doable. You know, you don't want to shave off too much too fast because that's just not healthy for the young man. Mm -hmm. um, but they want to get him down to around 380 just to kind of get his, you know, stamina a little bit up. But e even as of now, he's unblockable in the middle from, from what I'm hearing. And uh, as he gets his stamina up and, and can be able to get off the block a little bit quicker, he's, he's going to be a force. And so he's going to be fun to watch. I don't know if he'll be ready to start this year, but he's definitely going to get some playing time. Yeah, I'm excited to see some of these young players step up, and not even just the freshmen here. I'm, I'm excited to see, like, the Derek Winkles and the Tyron mm -hmm. Hoppers, uh, Gervin Dexter. Those are the guys that I'm really excited to see because a lot of veterans did leave after last season. Right. So these are what, the unit, yeah. what unit are you most excited to see, quote-unquote, to watch on Instagram Live? Uh, what, <laughs> what unit do you think needs spring the most? This defense, year. defensive line. There's no question in my mind. Uh, I think the O line really lost out on some key development time last in spring. I know a lot of positions did, but I really wanted to see Josh Braun develop over the course of last spring. You know, at the end of the 2019 season, I was thinking Josh Braun was getting that orange the um, bowl practices, um, the orange bowl practices in there. He was going to be in the spring, and I thought, wow, this this kid who's very talented, talented recruit, a great win by Florida, bringing in Josh Braun. They're going to have a months in there. He might even get in the starting lineup after, you know, a few weeks. Mm -hmm. I thought he was going to be kind of like that Ethan White guy who came in and worked his way in there, already going to be in a rotation. And I thought they were going to able to use him. And I didn't picture John DeLance in that starting lineup after a while with Josh Braun getting that development. Um, that didn't happen. Right. Uh, so Josh Braun did not have that development. A lot of players didn't have that extra practices of last year. So I think that's where this year I'm thinking the O-line is going to play such a big role. It really, I, I know we always say in SEC football, it's going to be one in the trenches. But mm -hmm. when you look at what Florida's strength is this year, O-line is going to be crucial. You have a dual threat quarterback who's very different than Kyle Trask, which Dan Mullen showed, said on the press mm -hmm. conference. Um, he is a guy that can use his legs to his advantage and you do have such talent in that running back room. My, like, like who's going to be deep. one, two? They are five deep. I think that running back, sorry to, yeah. just to cut in on you, but I think that running back unit is so deep that you can make Daquan Wright or Malik Davis a slot receiver. I think Malik Davis should live in the slot. I, I think yeah. like right now, just make a decision. Malik Davis, yeah. Malik Davis in the slot. I think there was one game uh, last season, they had over 100 yards receiving, and he was one of the top receivers of the game. Um, yeah, he was like the third or fourth. I think he was the fourth receiver overall last season. Yeah, so just put him in the slot. You have yeah. you have Lorenzo Ring Lingard, Demarcus Bowman. Uh, you have Damian Pierce, uh, Naquan Wright. Move Malik mm -hmm. Davis into that slot. Um, and I think because you have all that, the O line is going to be the position group that I'm thinking needs to show a lot of improvement and chemistry between this group and they just need to make sure they have a great rotation in there just in case that they do have injuries and that's my worry about the o-line is not just the starting guys but do they have talent enough and that depth and quality depth like do they have enough experience do they have you know do they have that depth if that first line someone on the first line gets injured that is that is what I wanted to see from the spring. And I, I, you know, hearing from the scrimmage, they did rotate guys in several different positions, including at center. So that's the unit that I think is the most important to develop in the spring and could determine a lot coming in to the fall. Yeah, I think John Hevesy said they were going to rotate four guys at center. Uh, Ethan White, Stuart Reese, Kingsley, and um, I'm blanking on who the fourth one was. I'm sorry. 
I'll be better prepared next time. Uh, my unit is the secondary. And I know I told you safeties, but now I'm cheating and saying secondary <laughs> overall. <laughs> because uh, it was, I'm going to say this the nicest way I can. It was <laughs> abysmal last year. It was just straight up abysmal. And if, uh, if I was Jules, and if I was, uh, I think Crime Dog is what they call mm -hmm. the other new coach, um, I would just put up, when, when they come into meetings for this entire off season, the wall should be filled with pictures of the Texas A&M running back and tight end, catching anything they wanted to over them, and maybe even the Oklahoma game as well. Um, because it was, and, and I don't really know what happened. Um, and I wish I did, because I feel like I lose a little credibility saying I don't know. But, but when you look at who was coming back, th there shouldn't have been that drop off. And they knew that defense. The defense didn't change. And, and listen, this is not me being a Todd Grantham apologist, but the defense didn't change. They ran it fine the year before that. You know, whether or not you liked it in 2018 and 2019 is up for debate. I personally was always a fan of Todd Grantham's defense. I don't do drugs, and I felt like it was the closest <laughs> I would ever get to an acid trip. Um, but in 2020, it, they were running the same defense, and they just didn't run it well at all. There was no communication. Whatever. We're not going to beat a dead horse. It was bad in 2020. And a lot of that hinged on the secondary. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I thought Kyrie Elam had a pretty decent year. He's coming back. Um, but what are they going to put around him? You know, who? because it is going to be a lot of young guys now. You lose Steiner, you lose Wilson, you lose Sean Davis. Uh, you know, I'm sure some people cheer right now when they hear that because of last year. Um, but those guys were veteran guys. They did know the defense. Whether or not they ran it adequately last year is is up for debate. It'd be a pretty short one because we know how the we know what the answer is. Um, but they did know it. So how fast can you bring these young guys along under new coaches, mind you? Um, because that's going to be the key. Because it doesn't matter how many points you put up if you can't stop the other team as well. And I think we're seeing as college football evolves, pretty much any team's going to be able to put up points nowadays. Um, you know, and and Florida last year could hang in a shootout and that's what the Alabama game was it was a shootout um defense played an incredible third quarter but if they do the same in the second quarter and don't let Alabama score at the end of the first half that's an entirely different game mm -hmm. and um so you, you know what are they going to do in that secondary what are they going to build around Kyrie Elam that's what I think is one of the most crucial aspects of spring this year for the Gators and hopefully the secondary puts their best foot forward, Cassidy. <laughs> Too soon. Too soon. <laughs> but um, right. um I, I know everyone wants to talk about spring football too, but we also have basketball going on right now as well, Cassidy. Do, 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 do. <laughs> and they, they are starting the SC basketball tournament. I know I sense a little bit of apathy in the SEC, I mean the Florida fan base when it comes to this team, but this team has gone through a lot this year, Castor. Mm -hmm. You and I have talked about this a lot. Keontae Johnson collapsing in December. Uh, the, these these guys seeing their best friend, their brother, you know, not knowing uh, the prognosis, what is he, right. what's going to happen. Um, they did grow up really quickly, and you did mm -hmm. see that emotional maturity. I thought, wow, this team put together and around like around January when things were coming together. I was like. Wow, look at the development of these guys, Trey Mann, Castleton, all these guys. I thought, wow, this could be a team that makes mm -hmm. something happen from a, a, a year where we had COVID, where we had, you know, a player going down in, uh, for medical emergency. But then the old kind of worries kind of clawed back mm -hmm. with consistency, the last two games in particular. They were playing the winners of Texas A&M and Vanderbilt, and they could possibly play Tennessee again the third time for this year. They kind of split one-on-one. -on -one. Um, on the year so and if they just a, a quick note if they play if they end up playing Texas A&M because they'll play whoever wins that play-in game if they end up playing Texas A&M it'll be the first time this season mm -hmm. they'll have faced them because their previous games got canceled because of COVID and then the snowstorm and um that that would be interesting just having no no like scouting really of them from personal experience right. uh, and I think uh you know the, the Gators sent out a note it would be the first time in decades that that had ever happened like playing a team in the tournament that you didn't face in the regular season just small side note 
Yeah, and, and I think that's one of the things, you know, we've discussed is this is such a weird season. You, you know, you've got teams that you thought were going to do well this year and they're struggling to get to the 500. Mm-hmm. Um, you have Kentucky team, had no players on the all SEC team. Exactly. Who, if you came into this year pre-COVID, they think you're crazy. Right. Um, but just, just, just the way the, the world around COVID and this basketball season kind of just turned everything on its head. Florida would have momentum and then they would miss a game because of COVID protocols. And I think you can't really judge this team completely because of COVID. But then again, when you see the old problems, your mm-hmm. mind goes, how much more can you take? Right. Um, so we're going to You see can't how- judge this team, but if this team is doing the same thing the last team did, you've got to, you, you see the, you, start you see and- the, you see the pattern. Yeah. Yeah. So again, I don't, I, Mike White's not on the hot seat, but things are going to get warmer next year if the problems persist in mm-hmm. a world where COVID is not determining that your game is not being played. So one of the things that we are also looking forward to, Cassidy, is getting to know former Gators a little bit more mm-hmm. now as well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, whenever Jackie and I kind of talked about this segment, I just kept referring to it as later Gator. I just think that's funny. So that's what we're going to call it, is sticking. Uh, Later Gator is just going to give us an, exa- an opportunity to talk to former athletes, athletes that we've covered or maybe athletes that came before our time but made an impact on the Florida Gator program in a variety of sports. And sort of keeping in the basketball theme, we were making a list of our guests, and there was one guy at the top that we just kept coming back to, and I said, we've got to talk to Patrick Young because I think he made one of the most indelible marks on this Florida Gator program in quite a while. And uh, he, you know, we talk about this year causing a lot of adversity for the Gators with Keontae Johnson and then with COVID. Um, And that's something that Pat knows a lot about. And uh, we were able to have a really good conversation with him a couple of days ago. If you remember anything about Pat, he can talk a lot. So we're actually going to do a little bit of it this week and then a little bit of it next week, which you'll see later on. Uh, But he, he really opened up about what he's been doing since he graduated. Uh, what life looked like in professional basketball, and then even what he's doing now in Gainesville and Jacksonville back to return to his community. So uh, enjoy our first episode of Later Gator with Patrick Young. Thank you so much for joining us today. You were our very first guest here on mine and Jackie's new podcast, so thank you so much. Uh, You were at the top of our list, so is that nice to know that you, you wanted to be the first one? Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful. That's humbling. I don't know why you want to waste your time on a guy like me. Uh, but all, all I do, all I've done is put a ball through a hoop and, and smile while doing it. But if that makes me relevant, sure, let's do it. Smile while doing it. That got you in Cosmo. Why not get you on this podcast, right? Um, me on Cosmo? Yeah, you don't remember that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Here the 2014 Final Four run, they did like a whole March Madness thing. It, it was like counting down anyways yeah i'll send it to you yeah. you were in Cosmo. okay okay cool <laughs> put that on your list of accolades yeah so you can uh, add it to your resume that, exactly i think that should be down, down there for sure for those that don't remember just a refresher pat paid played for the Florida Gators from 2010 to 2014 was a part of that magical final four run in 2014 and now like we said the first guest here with us this week First, just catch us up, Pat. What have you been doing? We know you played overseas for a little while. What has life looked like for these past few years and then today? Oh, where to start? Um, Cliff Notes version. Let's, 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 let's go for it. Okay. So after that, you know, some of the best basketball, best experience of my life playing with my brothers, Will You Get, Scotty Wilbekin, Casey Prather, Mike Fraser, Dorian Finney-Smith, uh, members of that team. I went on to play professionally. I did not get drafted. Um, and for me, I've come to realize that you have one of two choices. When adversity hits, you can sulk and be a victim. And you have every right to uh, be justified in being angry or upset or whatever it may be. Or you can see it as a challenge, an opportunity to um, overcome and get better and be part of your story. So that's what I did. Uh, I got a summer league opportunity with the New Orleans Pelicans. Had an extremely large chip on my shoulder that I was going to prove everyone wrong. Um, within the first game in summer league, I came off the bench. I think I played about 20 minutes. I put uh, 11 points, 13 rebounds, and they signed me uh, at, right after that game to a uh, non-guaranteed contract. I was with the Pelicans for a little bit. It, you know, it was difficult just because uh, Monty Williams was on the hot seat, and I um, I was a, like 15th guy on the roster. There were like five other big men on the team, 
uh, including Anthony Davis, which is younger younger than me being the team captain. So that was that was very humbling, very weird. Uh, but I ended up getting cut um, after we started a, abysmal abysmally. We were nine and sixteen after a back to back from uh, Atlanta and Washington. Got cut right after we landed. That was something I won't forget. Yeah. And um, long story short, on that, I get cut. I pack up everything I own from my apartment in New Orleans and my, my red Honda Accord, my baby that I had since, uh, since high school, drove seven hours from New Orleans to Jacksonville on the phone with everybody, family, agents, uh, best friends, whatever, trying to figure out what's next. Do I do the G League? Do I go to the uh, overseas? Uh, took a leap of faith and went overseas to Turkey. Um, 48 hours later, I was in a game. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, was, I was in a game. That's like culture uh, shock. Oh my gosh, it was, it was, what was so crazy was that, um, you know, the long travel, um, then if you don't know, Istanbul, Turkey has, uh, they, they're one and two between, behind uh, Moscow, Russia for the worst traffic in the world. So I was stuck <laughs> in traffic for like three hours to get to the hospital. Then at the hospital, you know, go through all this medical testing there for about six hours. Um, and I knew, and like, and then I, I, you know, sleep for, you don't sleep well because you're jet lagged and then you're in a game. Like you have, I had a walkthrough um, of the plays and I'm like, is, is he really going to try to play me today? <laughs> like, <laughs> so, so ended up playing in that game, zero points, one rebound, as you can imagine. Like there's no way I was going to be effective in that game. And we lost. Um, finally got a good night's sleep, play, played really well, ended up playing extremely well that entire year. Carlos Arroyo, um, if you guys know who that was, uh, a great Puerto Rican point guard that was in the NBA, was my point guard there in Turkey. He literally threw me a lob to dunk an alley-oop almost every single pick and roll. I was not used to it. But basketball was so fun. It was so much fun at that point. We weren't a winning team, but I really enjoyed the, the opportunity. Um, it afforded me the opportunity to play summer league with the Clippers. But because um, I had a great opportunity in Greece, uh, the two-year guarantee contract, I decided to take that versus doing summer league. Uh, mm -hmm. was doing extremely well with the, the team in Greece. They're a well-known team. Nicolaitis, former Gator, is out there, was out there for a while. Uh, he was playing for the rival team. Um, <laughs> I was playing really well at the beginning of the season. Then I got injured. Uh, first injury, never, as you guys know, I never missed a game in Florida. Right. Uh, never had mm -hmm. it, never had an injury before. Um, I was in the wrong place. You know, you can look back and say this and that happened, whatever. But still, we go back to that victim mentality or being, you know, ownership. Uh, so it took me a while to get to that point um, because I was I got hit in the back of the knee. It wasn't like one of those non-contact, right. you know, you land funny, you turn, something like that. Um, so I ended up missing that whole season. Um, ended up getting, I, I, fortunately, my team let me come back to get surgery with Dr. Andrews, uh, the world-renowned uh, doctor. He's like 85 years old and still performing surgeries right now. Like every day. day. Like, <laughs> like, like, bro, like just retire. You just teach. Like, what, like why do you still need to do surgery? Um, so after I was in Greece for two years, uh, I went on to play in Italy. I still was having some is issues with my knee. Um, I had to get surgery to clean up my meniscus. Um, ended up getting an infection after surgery. And that was crazy. That was probably one of the hardest moments in my life where I ended up, I was in the hospital for two weeks. Um, near death, I, I had to go under three additional surgeries to clean out that infection. I was, I had to get a pick line. If you guys aren't familiar with that, mm -hmm. uh, it's where they, they put this, this IV through your arm. So you're getting direct antibiotics for six weeks. I had to relearn everything, how to walk, how to believe in myself, how to, you know, so much things I had to overcome, uh, was able to overcome, came back to play basketball through faith, through my family, my support, um, played again, um, in Italy. That was the last year I really played like a full season. It was awesome. I was in um, this city in the south of Italy. It, it's, it was, no, call it a city. It was, it was a modern day town. It was like maybe nothing but young people up to like age 18 and like 60 and up because people, there's nothing to do there. So once you turn 18 and you can like, you leave your parents, everyone leaves. So, but the fans were so awesome. It was a great experience. Um, I, what I, city was up, it? What, yeah, what city did you live in? The name, of the, the name of the city is Avellino. A-V-E-L-L-I-N-O. -V -V -E -L -L it's about 45 minutes east of Naples. That's okay. where my dad's from. Okay. because Jackie grew oh, up really? there. Yeah, that, okay, that, yeah. yeah that, my dad's yeah. from Naples, but I grew up in... That's awesome. 
Did you get a chance to, uh, oh, in Coma, that's uh, north of Milan. Mm-hmm. Um, a chance to drive in Naples. Uh, no, we, I, I was, only, I was like, I was like nine or 10 when I, we lived around there. So I never drove, but I heard my mom cuss in every, she's from Brazil. So she said that it was worse than driving in Sao Paulo, which is probably one of the worst cities in the world to drive. She would curse yeah. up a storm. I should probably yeah. think that my nine-year-old shouldn't hear. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> well, literally like it's, it's, everybody's car has a bump or a scratch or something yes. or whatever it's because it's acceptable that you're going to hit each other like the scooters the scooters are the worst the scooters and the mopeds they just weave through they, That's they, like they, they, they drive around like they're trucks like they own the road and like it's if, if you, if you pedestrian. oh if you block them while they're trying to weave you're the, you're in the wrong and it's like it's i came to understand you know, just be as safe as you can be. You know, <laughs> let them cuss you out. It's just okay. Just keep your eyes forward. Don't worry. Don't don't look at them, and and things will be fine. But um, you know, after after I uh, I went on to play in Israel this past year, um, for a little bit, I got cut just because you know I, it just wasn't the right fit. COVID definitely affected a lot of things as far as money being guaranteed. Um, so I, I came back home. Um, I decided to just like chill and just relax and, and commit myself to doing what makes me happy, being surrounded by my family, uh, being involved in the community, really serving, um, finding this beautiful place to live, being with my dogs, uh, being able to interview and start my podcast, being able to uh, interview for the SEC network. It's been, it's been all around great. So that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Everybody's doing well. Um, my golf game still is about as bad as it was before. Um, <laughs> I started, you know, back before I stopped playing basketball. But, yeah, that's, that's where we are right now. SEC Network, that'd be really cool. And that's what your degree was in, right? Yes, yes. My, my undergrad is in telecommunications, and I'm currently pursuing my master's in science of management. I'll be finished by the summer. That's awesome, Pat. That's really cool. And you have a new podcast, like you said. Just give people a little summary of what that is and where they can listen. So it's called The Young and the Rowdies. Credit to me. I Love mean, it. I, I, I came up with that name. Uh, literally, I interview everyone and anyone that's been through Florida basketball. Uh, coach, current player, former player, former coach. It's been about uh, 18 episodes in. Scotty Lewis was the last one. Uh, Ka- Colin Castleton. I will tell you, I love that kid. I absolutely. He is amazing. His story. I'm glad you uh, mentioned him because I think he's the best post player they've had since you. Yes, 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 he is. He literally, like, he play, he was at Michigan for two years, and even though he didn't play, he just took on the mindset, I'm going to be a sponge, I'm going to learn, I'm going to work, and I'm going to wait for my time. And he didn't – it wasn't about him uh, being angry at anyone or feeling he wasn't treated right. He just wanted to come back to his family, and, and he left the door open with great communication with Coach White. And now we see how well he's doing. I guess it's literally no surprise. So, um, yeah, the podcast has been really cool. I'm trying to get every single uh, Gator basketball player to, co- to be on that. So, uh, yeah, that's, it's, it's, been, it's been a blessing. You know, you talked about all the adversity you faced, you know, the last few years and, and in Europe through your surgery and recovery. And then you look at, you know, you talked about cat. And just in, like this team, whenever I watch this current basketball team and all the adversity they faced when they saw, you know, Johnson collapse and, you know, yeah. back in December, they, we didn't even know if they wanted to play um, any more of the season. Um, I just look at how much they've grown up and mature. Yeah. It's quite remarkable, the transformation. I know, I know Mike White and this team gets overly criticized, but I, I think it's remarkable what they have done, the emotional growth that they this team has we can't really stress enough how much they've had to deal with we can't like I I literally just sit down thinking about this team like Scotty Lewis Trey man these guys that are their first two years they have probably gone through more adversity than just about anybody uh any any college player you know 18 19 year old kid has faced in their two years and the way that they've handled it after you know interviewing Scott and just his mindset, his maturity. I was like, wow, this kid really has his priorities straight. He's finally starting to – things are starting, starting to click for him. And the other guys as well, it's just we need to see that consistency because uh, I, was, I was so dis- – not disappointed, but I was speaking so well of them, highly of them going into that Missouri game. They just lost at home. 
And I felt so embarrassed because I was like, yeah, we're going to win. I can't wait to watch it. And then we lose. Uh, so I just, I just hope they can string. I mean, now it's do or die at, at just about at this point. I hope they can string some wins together. They got uh, Tennessee right now. Um, and then they have the SEC tournament coming up and then the NCAA tournament. So uh, just hoping that they can finish this year strong. Yeah, consistency has definitely been a problem with Florida the last few years. But, right. you know, when you look at this team, do you feel like 2020, 2021 season, it's going to be so hard to judge this team when you look at all the stuff that went on with COVID, with Keontae Johnson? Do we – do we give them a pass this year or how, how would you view it when you're looking at it? Because, you know, obviously last year when you when you're going into this year, I think a lot of people were thinking this would be like the do or die season for Mike White and how we kind of look the future. But is it fair to kind of put that pressure on this team? I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's fair to, to put that kind of pressure on this team. Not And not giving them a pass because at the end of the day, you still got to step out there and play. Uh, you still got to, you, you know, you go into Kentucky, you beat them at home. You show that you are capable of doing great things. But absolutely, this year, with if Keontae Johnson, you know, what's happened to him, if that does, this team's completely different. This year is completely different, as well as the how many games got stopped because of COVID. DeRuzzi had COVID. Scotty had COVID. So many other players. All the pro, you got to think about just the the mental aspect for these guys of not having a normal college life experience, the stuff outside, because they are student athletes right now. They're not, yes, basketball is the you know, primary thing that they, they're doing, but they're still students. They're still, you go to college, you experience life, you experience uh, some intentional diversity, people from all around the, the world, the country, and all that's been taken away. The, the in-person classes, the getting to experience and doing things together to build that chemistry, having friends that don't play basketball, you know, and like those, those things are important for your mental health. If, if, you, if you're not, those, you know, the eight inches up here, if these, if, if it's not doing healthy, you know, the basketball part is going to sh suffer as well. And Coach White has done a tremendous job uh, of getting these guys as well prepared as he can in the circumstances. So we definitely do have to give him another shot with it, depending on how things are next year. If it's the same, um, at least they're prepared for, and they know what to expect. Versus, you know, this is coming out of nowhere. So we, we, we will see. I, he, he should not be on the hot seat this year. I, I don't think so. You know, I saw a stat the other day. Sorry, I dipped out. I upgraded our minutes real quick. Um, <laughs> I saw a stat the other day that said, you know, because Sparta fans focus on the fact that they've lost to FSU like the past six times. But Seven. Hamilton <coughs> just, <Isn't it>? <laughs> Seven. <laughs> which is, is, I'm sure is a very painful. Um, but Hamilton just got a five-year renewal. Mike White's done better in the tournament. So is that not the stat? And you tell me, as someone who's played it, is that not the stat that should matter more? Well, you, yeah, yes, it does matter more. You get it, though. Uh, they're our rivals. They're Florida, it's Florida State. They, they, I, I took my hat off to Leonard Hamilton because his, he has been bringing some oh, he's, Yeah, he's done incredible. Talent. He's been and that team last year, I feel so bad because I think that team last year really had a shot in the tournament okay. of making some noise. They were probably going to be a one seed uh, in, in the South or wherever it may have been and really had a chance to make a run in the tournament. Um, yeah, Coach White has done better. I mean, we were up eight points in 2017 in, against South Carolina uh, from being in the Final Four, you know, his first Final Four ever. Uh, I don't know that Florida State's a higher going to be a higher seed this year going into this tournament as well. I, I saw that they're projected to be like a two or a three seed. Florida, I'm not exactly sure what we might be, um, depending on how we finish here in the tournament. But, um, you know, the tournament does, does matter most. The tournament is where I think a coach makes his, you know, as far as how you do in your, in your, uh, in your conference, as well as how you do in your NCAA tournament, your, your uh, you know, postseason stuff, determines really whether you're going to keep your job or not. So we want Coach White to keep winning the keep your job games. <laughs> Thank you so much to Patrick Young for coming on and talking to us for our very first episode. We enjoyed talking to him so much that the conversation kept going after that conversation. And we got a lot into the final four run of 2014, what it was like to be on that team with those four seniors, what he and those other guys have been doing since, how much they still keep in touch. And uh, here's a, quick little snippet and a teaser for next week's episode with even more with Patrick Young. Bubbles are going everywhere. Bouncers can't keep people out anymore. Everybody comes in. Finding food. What do you remember about that night? None of it. 
<laughs> I, can believe I remember I remember being at the the swamp uh-huh. uh for a second and um having the net on my yep. net uh, so some of those memories kind of blur mm-hmm. in together thank you so much all again for being here for this first episode of double coverage with Jackie and Cassidy really the only reason we can do this is because of y'all and because we know how passionate you are about your teams and we just want to talk about it with you and take you a little bit behind the scenes, give you access that maybe others can't, just to show you what it's like to be around these athletes, to be around these coaches, to be around these families, and a deep dive into this program that you love so much. Jackie, do you want to say goodbye to everyone for this first week? Yeah, first off, thanks for watching us today. You know, um, we are just so excited to get this going. You know, Cassidy and I were talking about this 2019 fall season, and we said, wouldn't it be fun if we did something like this? Um, and again, thank you for, for letting us, you know, talk your ears off of Wendell Vision and Gators football. And we're going to start, you know, talking about different topics as well. Any, you know, and we also take suggestions too in our comments on YouTube. If you want us to talk a little bit more about things, if you have questions about Gators football, about Gators basketball, feel free to leave questions on this YouTube comment section and then we'll hopefully be able to answer your questions during our next podcast for next week. Thanks guys. See you next week.